Indranil was saying that, I, I, as you remember in, in uh, yesterday's lecture, as you remember in or whatever last time's lecture, we identified e to the power i h with the fermion, e to the power minus i h with sidebar. Okay, and uh, um, we had also identified in the Ramond sector e to the power plus minus i h by two as Ramond sector states, and then. Um, Okay, well, part of the identification was if you take anything that can be made with the identity operator and action of products of size, size and side bars on it, that was to be identified by things that you can get by e to the power i m h, where m was an integer, and then oscillators. Okay, this is what Indra Neil was asking about. Uh, if you remember, we looked at the partition function of such things, and we compared it with the partition function of such, uh, su uh, such things, and we saw that at low numbers that agreed. Okay, um, there's a separate identification, which is suppose you take the fermions in the Ramon sector. We take the fermions in the Ramon sector, okay, and uh, uh, look at the full Hilbert space in the Ramon sector. Okay, that is in one-to-one -one correspondence with such lattice vectors plus integer shifts. So lattice vectors of the form e to the power i m plus half h and then oscillators. Okay. You remember that this was forced on us from the fact that these, this we checked was the ground state dual to the Ramon sector vacuum. And then you could build other states in the Ramon sector by taking, by bringing psi's and psi bars near to these guys. But psi is e to the pi h, so you'll be able to get any shift you want. And plus you get all the oscillators. Okay, so just the identification of sectors went like this, that integer momenta on the eighth side, mapped to things you can may get with arbitrary products of size and side bars. That's, you, want, you may want to call it the Nevu-Schwartz character. Okay, the, the, the character, the, the Nevu-Schwartz Hilbert space. Okay, on the other hand, things that you got from the Ramon sector vacuum, acted on then by arbitrary numbers of size and side bars, gives you, let's call it the Ramon character, the Ramon Hilbert space. Which is the uh, which is all uh, um, which is all uh, um, states that you can get by uh, taking such uh, such shifts in H, such momenta in H, and uh, uh, then by acting on that with uh, uh, with oscillators as well. Okay, so that's great. So now. Um, uh, Okay, that's one of the things we'd done in the last two classes. The other thing we discussed in some, some detail was uh, actual circle compactifications. Actual circ uh, circle compactifications of, uh, of uh, scalar fields. And uh, if you remember, we had found that PL was equal to uh, N by R plus minus WR uh, by alpha prime. Okay. PL slash R was this formula, the left and right moving momenta. And uh, um, for the application to the discussions of this, uh, this boson here, uh, let's go back to the, uh, this was convenient when, when our bosons were space time bosons, so we had this alpha prime in the game. But you remember that our rule was to go back to this canonically normalized scalar here. We just said alpha prime equals two. Okay. So this, this, you said that this will be equivalent to fermion hmm. at a self dual radius. Hmm. I mean, I, I, at square root 2 times self dual radius. Depend on where you yeah, yeah uh, whatever. It will be dual to that something. Yes. Yeah, why will not have a duality? Yeah. So point, point. Why will not have at a duality? place. I'll, I'll show it to you in some detail. But uh, go on, please go on. Yeah. No compactification radius. However, 
somehow secretly there always was because you see that once I gave you a vacuum yes. I was only allowing integer shifts yes. okay oh, sorry. that was a rule now you can ask what physics gives you such a rule and that rule will come from compactification okay, okay. okay we'll see that now No, it will be either square root 2 or 1 by square root 2 times that. Yeah. Um, square root 2 and 1 by square root 2 are the same because they are <laughs> T duals of one another. Hmm. Okay, well, let's see. Okay, so we had this formula for the left and right moving, uh, moving momentum for the bosons. If we want to compare with this language, we want to set alpha prime equals 2. Okay, so let's do that from now on. So we have PLR is equal to n divided by uh, uh, n divided by r plus uh, omega r by, by 2. Now let's immediately answer in the Niels question. There, are, there is one um, obviously interesting uh, uh, radius in this game which is r is equal to square root alpha prime which in this language is r is equal to square root 2. That is, a, that is an obviously interesting radius. That's not exactly the radius we want to sit at. We want to sit at something very similar. So we let us sit at the radius r is equal to 1 in this language. Okay. Note that this is not r equals square root 2. So whether you call it square root 2 times or 1 by square root 2 times the self-dual radius is a matter of choice because the duality flips the two. Okay, but anyway, at the moment we're just at r equals 1. Okay. <coughs> now if we're at r equals 1, let's look at these, uh, uh, let's look at these, these momenta. We have PLR is equal to uh, n plus w by 2. Note that this is a unit such that PL is equal to 1 and PR equals 0 is to be identified with psi and PL is equal to 0 and PR is equal to 1 is to be identified with psi bar because now we've gone to the units where you know this is e to the power i h is psi. Okay? Great. So now let's look at this formula for a moment. Note that our spectrum includes every value of n and w. Positive, zero, negative. That was our rule. That was our rule when we started studying circle compactification. Okay? So let's, let's look at a few values of these PLRs that, that occur. Okay. Firstly, of course, we have n is equal to 0, w is equal to 0. This is the identity. Okay, n equals, so I'll just make a list, okay, I'll just make a table. So, n equals 0, w equals 0, and then what I'll do is list PL, PR. Like this. So, we'll tabulate a few values and then see what we, see what, what's happening. Okay, so let's put this, so, so we're tabulating PL, PR, of course this is clearly 0, 0. Now what about N is equal to 1, W equals 0? This gives us 1, 1. Okay, and let us also put a line to say, can we identify the operator in fermionic language? Right? In fermionic language, of course, this is identity. In fermionic language, this is psi times psi bar. Okay? But now let's look at other things. Let's look at n is equal to 0, w is equal to 1. Why is that psi psi bar? Because it's e to the power, you see, what was the rule? It was e to the power i p l h, e to the power i. Sorry. 
हेलो इन द मॉर्निंग ओनली एल एक्स पी या I I gave her around uh, 10 o'clock, and she can have an Alex now. That's fine. And uh, uh, about 10 o'clock, and now she can, she should also have the multivitamin if she doesn't mind it, and give her the antibiotic. Yeah, yeah. And now she should have only Alex Zinkovich and not, and then the antibiotic at night. Yeah. Okay. Chat. Bye. Bye. Okay. Now look. Now look at this. Suppose we have n is equal to zero and w is equal to one. What do we get here? Yes, we get half minus half. So clearly, what we are in here is the. Okay. So I'm going to use the following notation. Let's say e to the power i h by two. I call the plus Raymond vacuum. And e to the power minus i h by two, I call the minus Raymond vacuum. You remember, you remember the Raymond vacuum is doubly degenerate. Okay, but the two distinct vacua. Uh, <coughs> here, what we get is plus minus. So we're in the Raymond state, and we're in the vacuum for both of them. But you get plus minus. Is this clear? Now let's do something a little more. Let's do n is equal to zero, w is equal to two. Okay, n is equal to zero. W is equal to two. Gives us one minus one. Okay, and uh, um, one um, and uh, minus one. Now, what was minus one? Uh, exactly. 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 So our notation, the problem was that our notation was lazy. Okay. We need bar. we need bar and tilde. Um, you know. So we we should say whether. Yeah, the complex and all and Exactly. Exactly. So what? Let's let's do your L and R. So this was L, and this was just R, and let's call it psi psi. Okay, uh, and this now is psi L psi bar. Yeah. Okay, is this clear? I'll, I'll list a few more, and then we'll see the general pattern coming out. Okay, what about n is equal to one, w is equal to half? W is equal to one. Okay. So we get three halves and and uh, plus half. Okay. Now what is this? This is psi l. This is the thing that you will get by acting psi l on a tensor product with plus. On plus plus. Right. On the other hand, if you take n is equal to one and w is equal to minus half, I'm sorry. The, minus the one. plus minus location is for the Raman sector. Right? Is for the Raman sector. The psi notation is, is for the Nebuchadnezzar sector. The psi notation is for the Nebuchadnezzar sector. Exactly. No, no. The psi, no, psi notation is for the operator. That operator right. can act on any sector. It's not a direct operator. <coughs> Right, so these are all sort of operators in, that are sitting in the big bosonic algebra, which we happen to know maps and something interesting, but right now we don't. Know. Right, this is you know if we if we acted on the the, never, the Ramon vacuum, right. you take that and bring the operator psi near it, yeah. that will give you that state or that operator. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And now, if you, if you join it up with minus one to the power f, then you get a two 
employment from representation. Are you writing that as plus minus? Or other thing you can do is psi 0 r square is 1 and psi 0 l square is 1. No, no, just left and right independently. Fourfold degeneracy in the Raman Raman sector, it's fourfold degeneracy. Yes, in the Raman Raman sector, you have fourfold degeneracy. Correct. And your plus minus, this plus minus is. Plus minus is on each side. <laughs> so when I say plus or minus, it means the left Raman is in plus okay, so and the right Raman is in minus. Okay. okay, so this this is basically plus R and plus left. Plus line. Plus line is plus plus left and plus right. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Sial offers only on the plus left. Uh, Sial acts only on the left sector, yeah. le the, the, the left sector and the Sial acts only on the right sector. Okay? It is a bit confusing because there are four things. Because there are two sides on each side and also four vacuum as I said in the real time. Okay? I am going to list a few more and then we will start seeing the general rule. Okay? Let's, let's but just continue this listing for a while. So let's take n is equal to 1 and w is equal to minus 1. So then what do we get? Um, here we get. Uh, and do you write every state as a operator operating on vacuum 1? I will, yeah, I will try to find a representation of each state. Okay. I mean, something convenient. Uh, what, just so that you have a picture to put to it. Okay. Okay, so we have n is equal to 1 and w is equal to minus 1. So that of course maps to um, half, so half and uh, 3 halves. Okay, and this thing is plus plus but acted on with psi right. Okay, so just a few more. What about one. n is equal to 1? And uh, um, oh yeah, let's let's first we've not, we've been a bit anti-democratic. We've not put n equals minus ones. <laughs> let's do n is equal to minus one. W equals zero. Okay, so that is minus one minus one, and so is exactly psi l ba psi r ba. Okay. Uh, Okay, you can fill out many more, but let's do two more. N is equal to one, W is equal to, let's say, two. Yeah. Okay, so this guy will be now two, zero. Two, zero. Okay, and you know what this, what this will be? It's basically psi del psi, psi L, del psi l because you bring two sides together but you know in the op psi zero the whole thing is zero so for the first operator that will will click which will be it will be psi del psi okay and so on okay we, we could just keep going what Well, psi L, psi L, you know, if evaluated at 0, it's just 0. So you took psi L, psi L at different points and did the OP. OP. And kept the leading term, which is the stress tensor. Which is the stress tensor, exactly. Okay, uh, maybe one more. So what about N is equal to minus 1? And, well, it's all the same, right? Okay, fine. Let's, let's stop at this. Okay. Now I want you to notice two or three things. The first thing I want you to notice is that we never had states in which the left moving fermion is in the Nebuchadnezzar sector, but the right moving fermion is in the Ramon sector, or vice versa. Okay, this is obvious for me because Ramon sector translated to half integer momenta. The only source of half integer momenta is this w by 2. So the left is half integer, the right is also half integer. 
Okay? So we see, firstly, that either we get NS, NS, or we get Ramon, Ramon. Is this clear? Is this clear? Okay. Now, the next thing I want you to notice is this. Let's look to start with in the NSNS NS sector. Notice that we never got a state which was made out of an odd number of fermion operators. In the uh, NSNS NS sector? If we count all fermion operators as the same. Psi, psi bar, both for left and right. You never get a state which is made up of an odd number of fermion operators. Okay? You either get 2 or 0. Or when you go to higher levels, you get 4. Okay? And let us see. Uh, that's probably a. Uh, could you please explain the class statement about the, yeah, uh, what you meant by odd number of fermion operators? Because yeah, it's, it's obvious actually. Yeah, okay. Okay, so it's just, there are only one point W is even, right? Which means that the two pluses around this have to just find even amounts. So the expectations on the two sides have to, so the, the ground state's going to be zero anyway to like get an integer expectations have to just look like this. Yeah, or, 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 or even more, right. Uh, please say yeah, what you think. Yeah, yeah, I understood that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, PL plus PR is an even number. Yeah, you are that's speaking only about number. the uh, NSNS sector, right? Yeah, at the moment only about the NSNS sector. Okay, so if you want to match with the spectrum of these operators from bosonic side, then you have to keep on the even number of onions. Exactly. You say, well, I mean, we're just saying it by enumerating. Yes. Okay? So in the NSNS sector, you see that we're not getting all of the NSNS sector. We're only getting those states in the NSNS NS sector. You can easily convince yourself that this is true, right? By just doing some gym mental but gymnastics. Minus one to the f is one. Exactly. So now we might want to define an operator which is minus one to the power f left plus f right. This is an operator such that minus one to the f left anti-commutes with both the left moving fermions, and minus one to the f right anti-commutes with both the right moving fermions. Yeah, you take a left moving fermion through this operator, you pick up a sign of minus one. You take a right moving fermion through this operator, you pick up a sign of minus one. Is this clear? You see, the fact that you're getting only an even number of fermions is the same as saying that we only count those states. Only those states appear such that minus one to the power f left plus f right is equal to one. So if we computed the trace of the Hilbert space in this sector, restrict for a moment to the NSNS, NS. what we would get is trace of NSNS NS minus 1 to the power FL plus FR plus 1 divided by 2. Fermion numbers, let me come to the Ramon sector in just one minute. I mean, let's first just look at, look at the rule. At least in the NSNS NS sector, this is what we're getting. So if this statement was just for NSNS? So far, just for NSNS NS sector. Okay. Now, let's look at the Ramon sector. What? Yeah. Exactly. In the Ramon Ramon sector, um, what we are seeing is the following. Even though, uh, let's take the sum of the two momenta. Let's take the sum of the two momenta here. Okay? Let's take the sum of the two momenta in this. We see here we got um, 0. 
here we got 2, here we got 2, and that will always go through. I am saying in the Ramon Ramon sector, okay, I am saying it's something that is so obvious, but yeah, because I mean, it is 2n. It is 2n, exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, let's, let's make that observation. PL plus PR is equal to 2n. Okay. Now, both the observations I wanted to make can be encompassed basically in this statement. Because minus 1 to the power f, okay, um, minus 1 to the power f, uh, fl is same as e to the power i pl. Right? Why is that? Why is it the same? Because you say, what is minus 1 to the power f? It's the thing that changes by minus 1. Uh, maybe I got the sign. I, I started with the prime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. It's the thing that changes by minus 1 every time you add a, add a fermionic operator. OK? And minus 1 to the power fr is equal to e to the power i. PR pi. Did you tell me there was symmetry being minus one? Being minus one, exactly. It's exactly that statement. Okay. So this statement, PL plus PR is equal to 2N, is always the statement that minus 1 to the pi FL plus FR is equal to 1. Now, in this is actually going to be our definition of minus 1 to the pi FL plus FR. It's really going to be e to the power i. PL plus PR into pi. Okay, I I, I want I, I I prefer this definition to to this guy because both of these obviously shift by minus one to the power. When I act with a fermion operator, both of these obviously shift by minus one. But if you have some intuitive notion of what fermion number is, maybe in the Nebuchadnezzar vacuum, it's very intuitive. Okay, identity operator should have minus 1 to the power f, 0. But what about in the Ramond vacuum? And this plus left has a fermion number 1. Uh, what should be if it just plus left has fermion number 1? Uh, plus left, you mean this one? Yeah. Well, it should have fermion number half, really. Because we are... Because yeah, you can go from one to the other okay, sorry. <laughs> by acting with the fermion. Yeah. Sorry, I'll just complete the sentence though. The sentence is though that whether you want to assign it pl plus half or minus half, you might, you might get a bit confused by. Okay? However, with this definition, this is as good a definition, right? Because of the shift symmetry. This is a very clear definition and gives you a clear assignment convention for each of these. Please go. Yes? You want me the place where I see something like the minus one to the number of fermions? It's just a question of commutation. And the fact that just looking at the NS side, it's magically ending out that it's always being plus one. Yes. Is to me, it's a, it's it's sort of makes sense because at the base, these are bosonic things; they're going to commute. So, like, even though if you want to write something that looks like it, it, it would tell you about the anti-commutation. Really, it should go away. But you know, it's a statement about the Hilbert space. The state with one fermionic oscillator yeah. acting on the vacuum is not there. Right. So, I mean, because you're really, you're building something out of bosons, and you're calling it fermions, but you're building something out of bosons. Maybe, so. maybe that's right oh. in some <laughs> sense. Yeah, maybe, maybe it is right. It's, uh, yeah, maybe it is right. Maybe it is right. Maybe. Uh, I mean, your, your comment is basically that del H went to, like, psi psi bar. This was a very nice operator on the left-hand side, and it mapped to a very nice operator on the left-hand side. Okay, I mean, perhaps. Uh, okay, I mean there's something to what you're saying. I, mean, I wouldn't, you know, swear that I would stand by it, but but okay, uh, fine. Okay, so do you understand that what we are doing in both sectors? Once we have a precise notion of what minus one to the power fl plus fr is, which is this notion, the shift symmetry, the momentum of of the boson, what we are doing is in this thing imposing the projection that minus one to the power fl plus fr is equal to one. It's totally manifest from here. 
because uh, PL plus PR is equal to an even integer. Okay? And so we come to this very interesting conclusion. If we wanted to compute the partition function of our theory, what we would do is to tra <laughs> trace in the Ramon-Ramon sector and trace in the Nebuchadnezzar's Nebuchadnezzar sector. <coughs> and in each of these sectors, put minus 1 to the power, put the projector onto FL plus FR is equal to 1. This is the partition function that counts all states or all operators in our theory. Is this clear? By construction. Now we'll check whether, uh, we've also, by the way, checked that the bosonic answer is modular invariant. Oh, somebody was supposed to check for us. <laughs> somebody has checked, right? <laughs> that the bosonic answer is modular invariant. Right? So it better be modular invariant. Okay? That was the whole point of going through the exercise in last class. That we did the bosonic answer honestly. So we were guaranteed to get a good modular invariant answer, and then we checked it. Yeah, but now let's, let's try to understand this modular transformation from a more transparent point of view. Okay, look, when you're computing now on the fermion side, you're computing a path integral. Okay, each of these terms, now this is a sum of four terms. In the NSNS sector, there's this. In the NSNS sector, there's this. In the Ramon Ramon sector, there's this. And then in the Ramon Ramon sector, there's this. Sign. Yes. I am saying that in between you cannot write a minus sign, then your modular invariants will break down. Not with at this state content. Yes, with, if you can, you can reorganize it and then you can probably put a minus sign. Yeah, as you will see when we look at type 2 theories, you do something a bit more sophisticated, where some of the signs go yeah. are, are, are minuses. Okay, but that requires you to have 8 fermions. It, it only works when you have eight fermions. It doesn't work when you have two. There's a separate modular invariant. We'll come to that very soon. Okay? But you're right that with this state content, this is all you could have done. Now, let me under, let, let's, let's try to understand that in a little more detail. Let's take each of these four terms here and write them as an independent path integral over fermions. So let's start with this term. This guy was in an NS, NS sector. So because this guy was in the NS NS sector, space, both left movers and right movers were anti-periodic. Let's call the horizontal axis space and vertical axis time. Why was it anti-periodic? Because you remember that the NS sector was so nice on the plane, but it was the sector that was anti-periodic on the cylinder. Okay. Okay. Now let's look at the guy first. That's one. That's not, that's not a time. Exactly. Exactly. Now, you know, there's this remarkable fact that for, when you take the trace over fermions and you rewrite it as a path integral, the fermions automatically become anti-periodic over the thermal circle. It's just a fact about fermionic traces. You try, try to write down trace. There's a sign from closing it up in the end. Okay? So this guy, as Indranil said, is minus 1, minus 1, even in the time direction. What does this mean? This means that if I take my fermions and I write down a path integral on the torus, the path integral has to be such that both the left moving as well as the right moving fermions are anti-periodic around this cycle and anti-periodic around this cycle. Okay? That was this guy. Good. So let's now write, let's write this guy out. This is still in the NS NS sector. So our boundary conditions are minus minus. However, because we've got this minus 1 to the power FL, there's an extra minus sign when we close up the time circle for the left movers, and then also an extra minus 1 when we close up the time circle for the right movers. 
and therefore the boundary conditions here are plus plus. transformation yes, ah yes. because you're moving like that that's correct that's correct it's this term well well there is one sign that let's finish it there's one sign that's free yeah. Let, now let's look at the Ramon Ramon sector. Ramon Ramon sector here, Ramon Ramon is positive. But let's <laughs> take the, the one. <coughs> As we discussed, <coughs> traces come with minus n. This is the ES transformation of the other one. And finally, there is this guy plus plus with plus plus. With anything. <laughs> yes, that's the reason. <laughs> okay. And as Indranil has been emphasizing in our theory, we get these sectors, these various things, with the relative sign plus 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 plus. This is zero, right? Yeah, zero. <laughs> but uh, you know, when you compute correlation functions, it's not zero. And you have to compute correlation functions with the same rules. So there's still content. There's still content to the fact that this comes with a plus, because you can put insertions. Yeah. So uh, I mean, if you wanted to compute finite temperature correlators in your, in your full theory. Yeah. Um, so you see here that what ha what's happening here is this. Look, this thing is obviously modular invariant. Some of these three by itself is obviously modular. Actually, let's look at this guy first. This guy by itself is modular invariant. So what is modular invariance? Modular invariance just is the statement that if you've got a torus, any two cycles are basically on the same footing. <coughs> but now, suppose fermions are periodic when they go across this cycle and periodic when you go across this cycle. Then they're periodic when you go across any cycle. The most general irreducible cycle is a one number times the horizontal cycle plus a relatively prime number times the vertical cycle. We want a cycle that doesn't break up into, into two. Okay? But, you know, if it was periodic here, it's periodic if you go m times across this guy and n times across this guy. So this guy is completely periodic. Okay? So all cycles are on equal footing. Okay? And this guy is modular invariant by itself. Do you understand what I'm doing? You see, the torus is a geometrical structure. But what we're doing here is picking out two cycles as somehow distinguished and giving the boundary conditions for fermions along those two cycles. But in a torus, no, to no cycles are particularly distinguished. You can choose any two. So you're breaking some democracy. You know, you're breaking that, that symmetry that all cycles are somehow the same. This set of boundary conditions does not break anything. This set of boundary conditions looks like, uh, looks like it. This, you might think, is also democratic. But it's not. Because what about on the 1-1 one -one cycle? If a fermion is anti-periodic as you go from here to here, and anti-periodic as you go from here to here, then it's periodic as you go from here to here. Okay? So, if there is a uh, sector which is minus, 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 you will be forced to have these other two sectors. Clearly, if you have this sector, you must have the other one, just by switching this guy and this guy. But also, if you have this sector, uh, if you have this sector, you must have all of these. Because, uh, uh, as we've just discussed, if you have minus minus and minus minus, if you go on, to, on this diagonal, it'll become plus plus, minus minus. Or equivalently, this guy, okay, we'll, we'll go back to, to this by doing the inverse operation. 
So it's easy to convince yourself just on you know very general simple geometrical grounds that if you want to build a partition function that's made up of these sectors, all three have to appear and have to appear with relative signs plus, as Indra Neel has been emphasizing. And that's how it does work directly from the from the bosons. Okay? And so now we finally get our statement of bosonization as a statement about theories. Okay? If we want not just some symmetries of chiral algebras, but of two well-defined theories, we now understand exactly what the statement is. The statement is that if you take the periodically identified boson at a radius which is, let's say, the, in our convention, 1 by square root 2 times the self-dual radius. Okay? Then that theory is the same as two left moving and two right moving fermions, provided we make a, we understand exactly what we mean by that fermionic theory. And, and that fermionic theory is defined, that its partition function is defined by this, this construction. So fermionic theory has in it both the NSNS and the RR sectors. No NSR or RNS sector. Okay, and it and the Hilbert space is projected to be plus one under my under the projector under minus one to the pi F L plus F R. Is this clear? Okay, so this has taken what was previously um, a duality between two algebras, or sectors, and converted into an actual duality between two real theories. This duality, by the way, is just 100% true. Uh, in the sense that if you take these bosons and put it on a, put it on a genus G Riemann surface, and you put the fermions with all these, put it on a genus G Riemann surface, you get the same partition function. Compute any correlation functions. <coughs> this, by the way, gives you a set of rules. This projection gives you a set of rules for what, what, <coughs> what operators you're allowed to compute correlation functions of. In the bosonic theory, these are these operators. In the fermionic theory, these are these operators, the ones we listed out. Okay, the operators that contribute to this partition function. The operators will have single-valued correlation functions with respect to each other. It's clear because we checked it in the bosonic example. Okay, uh, they uh, they will have single-valued co co uh, correlation functions with respect to each other. You know, it was dangerous because if we start taking things with the Ramon sector and Nebuchadnezzar sector, the Ramon sector had it's an e to the power i h by 2. Mm. And you might get funny, funny cuts as you go around. It's this coordination. The fact that, you know, this projector, for instance, plays a totally crucial role. Okay? That allows all correlation functions of allowed operators to be mutually local. Okay? So this now gives you a a well-defined theory of fermions. Okay? And this well-defined theory of fermions is dual to another well-defined theory of bosons. It has a very beautiful uh, geometrical interpretation, namely the, the theory of the bosons at uh, radius is equal to 1 over square root 2 times set dual radius. Okay. Uh, questions or comments? What? Well, the duality just says that you could either think of it as the theory of bosons at square at radius one by square root two times self dual radius, or square root two times self dual radius. These are actually the same theory. You know, the space of circle compactified bosonic theories is a half line. That's what actually T duality tells you. Is a half line. You know, you might have thought that the space of circle compactified theories. Oh, that's half line that doesn't end at zero. Let me let me say that more clearly. The space is, uh, is labeled by R with R greater than equal to square root two. Because if you have an R that is less than square root two, you derealize it. It just becomes the same the same conformal field theory. And the, the, uh, so T duality from this point of view is just talking about yeah. Let's do some. Uh, what if you did those with 
you would have found, you wouldn't have found psi and psi tilde in the spectrum, for instance. Because you would have had square root 2's all over the place. Yeah, square root 2's all over the place. And you would never have got, you, you would never, have, you wouldn't have got 1, 0 in the spectrum, for instance. It just is not, nothing nice happens. Okay, actually, the bosonic theory at the self dual radius, there is something nice about it. And we'll study it. Um, the nice thing about it is that it, uh, um, uh, the nice thing about it is that it has, uh, I mean, it, it has, it has interesting interplay with the SU2 uh, Wesumino Witten theory. Uh, we'll study this as we go along. Yeah. But if, if you have done this exercise with the other radius, you would have found the same state. Exactly the same. It would have just interchanged momentum and wind. As we discussed, right, the spectrum is exactly the same of these two theories. It makes no difference. It's just a different. R, R is equal to exactly. R is. That was the that was Yes. Yeah. It, it makes no difference. Though that's actually just writing down the same theory in different variables. Different ways, some bars will Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think in, uh, Indra Neil's intuition was that it's unnatural for this to happen at anywhere but the self dual radius because if it happens at one place, what about the other place? <laughs> but they are actually just the same theory. Okay, any further questions or comments about this? We, we have got everything except that if we didn't get the tachyon, we didn't get the tachyon, but otherwise, we, what are you missing now? What am I missing? We've not been done string theory so far. So it's just conformal field theory. If you had events that there's a 10 dimension, then you joined up with. Yeah. Joined up to find the one. If you, if you did that with this, with this, uh, uh, with this choice of projector, you would have got what people sometimes call type 2 theory, uh, type 0 theory. <coughs> it's, some theory right? it's some theory, but it has tachyons. It, it has tachyons. no supersymmetry. It's not a particularly physically interesting theory. Okay, we have to do something more to get something physically interesting. But physically, getting rid of tachyons. Getting rid of tachyons. Also, something that's nice is to make contact, at least in, our early, in the early days of study of string theory, is to get a theory which is space-time supersymmetric. Because it ensures that uh, various possible uh, worries you might have about the theory are not there. Even if you get rid of tachyons, you might wonder, worry whether the vacuum is per non perturbatively stable, for instance. You know, and then uh, studying non supersymmetric string theory is very interesting, but we should only do that after we completely understand the supersymmetric theories. Because at least those which sure make sense. No space time supersymmetry, exactly. Exactly. The, you see, the danger with. <coughs> what? No, we haven't, because identity operators there. Let us remember what, uh, what the translation is. Yeah, it was an NSNS sector, it was the identity operator, it was the tachyon. Exactly. Hmm. So this, this thing has the tachyon. Okay. Uh, great. Other questions or comments? Excellent. <coughs> Let's move on. Okay, there's one last thing. You know, um, uh, this little exercise that we did is not in Polchinski's book, which is really a shame. You know, I remember when I, uh, when I first studied this when I was a student, you know, the symmetry of algebras, that seemed too abstract to me. It took me a long, long time to realize, it's still such a simple thing, that it actually maps to a very simple symmetry between two real, real theories. Yeah. It's in the yellow book. It's in the yellow book, yes. <laughs> yellow book was after the time I, I was a so student. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, it was in you know, papers all over the place. But it's just something that, uh, if you're just reading Pulchinski, you don't realize. Okay, um, great. 
Now there's one last clearing up operation we want to do about, uh, <coughs> about uh, bosonization. And that's as follows. That goes as follows. Um, I cannot remember, did we ever talk about these linear dilaton conformal field theories? Okay, so let me quickly talk about that. Okay, uh, because we'll need it. Um, suppose you have 1 by 4 pi, oh, let's do that. 1 by 8 pi del h, the whole thing square. Maybe let's do it in space-time normalization. <coughs> because then we can easily put alpha prime equals 2. The, 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 yeah, the reverse is a little harder work. Okay, and uh, you remember that uh, um, our stress tensor for this theory was, now somebody who actually remembers to tell me, but was it LX? Did I get the factor right? Okay, so T was equal to minus, uh, minus 1 by alpha prime. This. Okay, now, Something I want you to, I, 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 I want to note is the following, that, you know, these things are free theories. And free theories are such simple things, that if by T you mean any operator that obeys the Vera Soro algebra, it's conceivable that the same theory might have more than one such operator. And in the case of the free boson, that, that conceivable thing is in fact true. Okay, let us take this plus A del squared X. Let's take this ob object and treat it as a trial stress tensor. Okay. I'm saying that there are, there's a one parameter set of inequivalent stress tensors. Uh, as you will see, uh, the central charge of the theory will change, will depend on A. So the algebra will change. The algebra will change, the central charge will change. But there are, in the set of operators built out of the free boson theories, there are many possible objects that you could identify as the stress tensor. It will give you set st stress tensors with different Vera Soro algebra. You mean LMs, you mean? Yeah, the that will get into yes. LMs. Yes, it will change the conserved charges. It's a completely different identification. There's some operator algebra in the theory, and we identified T as one operator, and then everything, the LMs came from that. Now I'm making another identification. You can give it another name if you want. Well, it will not change the energy because the energy will come by integrating this guy. Yes, sir. that's the kind of like energy, momentum, will it change those things? Uh, it will change LMs in general. There will be some things that it will not change. Let's check. What about the SL2 charges? Um, the, the, the SL2 charges, let's check. Okay, so T was equal to sum over M. Lm by z to the power m plus 2. Okay. So Lm was e is equal to z to the power m plus 1 uh, t. So the question you, uh, you guys are asking me is what? So now I'll put in this change in t. You, wa you want to know when is Lm, when is the change in Lm trivial? So that's the same as the question, when is z to the power m plus 1? times del 2 x trivial and in general it's not. Now it is trivial if m is equal to minus 1 and it presumably is also trivial if m is equal to 0 because you can integrate by parts twice and you'll get 0. But in general it's non-trivial. Most of the charges are changed. But the plus 1 was still part of the SL2 sequence. Uh, 
yes, plus one is still part of the SL2C. And uh, uh, let's see. So let's see. So which, which ones will it not change? So you want L is equal to zero plus one. So the Z square, there's Z and there's, Z, uh, and there's one. It will not change this. It will not change this. It will not change this, it will not change this, but it will change this. It will change basically the special conformal, the L1. It will change that. It's okay. Okay, but it will not change the energy and the momentum. Okay. Uh, which are linear combinations from the L0 and L0 part? Exactly. The, 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 this is a traditional improvement term. For the point of, from the point of view of the charge constructed out of T. But if you take T, dress it by some function of Z and then integrate, then it changes things. Okay? In fact, uh, there is a, if you want to understand where this term came from, from the point of view of the action. Um, okay, so this is an exercise. We consider the free boson which have this, and then put some number. I don't remember how this number relates to this A. It's proportional to A and some number. Number times R times X. R is the world sheet scalar curvature. Okay? If you add this to the action, notice that when the world sheet is, comp is discussed in flat space, <coughs> the theory has not changed. Okay, so the theory in flat space is unaffected. It changes the theory outside flat space. And the most important thing about that is that it changes the derivative of the action with respect to the world sheet metric. Right? You remember that R ZZ, sort of like del Z squared um, phi if, yeah, the wild factor. Hey, the important thing I wanted to say was that RZZ has a term with two derivatives and that is linear in the metric. So if you take this object and differentiate with respect to the metric, you'll get a term which has two derivatives on x, which is this, this object here. Okay? This is of course a standard thing, that if I tell you an action in flat, if I give you an action in flat space, and I ask, write down each stress tensor, that, that is a, an ambiguous statement. It's ambiguous because the way you get a stress tensor is by taking the, the theory, covariantizing it, and then differentiating with respect to the metric. And there may be many ways to covariantize it. Because there may be many different actions which are distinct in curved space, but that agree in flat space. Sir, this is a dumb question at this point. Yes. Uh, this uh, del x and uh, del square x uh, here, uh, they are with uh, the flat metric or the curved uh, metric? Uh, or this? this? Uh, both of them. I mean, if this and what, what is the second one? Uh, I mean, the, the first one, for the first term as well, this del x squared. Yeah. Yeah, so when we write them, when we write here, it is covariant, you know, full flat, full covariant, uh, covariant derivative. Though yeah. it makes no difference really because it's a scalar. Yes. But had it been something else, it would, be, it would have been the full covariant derivative. Yeah. Here, we have taken the stress tensor for this thing and then specialized to flat space. So after differentiating, we have said g is equal to eta. So there, it really means the flat space derivative. It's just del z square. I guess there should have been a question when we introduced the super theory. Yes. Right. So, right. The, the point with the x field is that it was a scalar. Yes. And we never thought about it. We have, well, we didn't need to add a connection. But yes. With the, with the fermions. Yes. They're not. So we could have tried to just assume everywhere that we had derivatives of fermions on the world field. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So. Of course, the fermions are spinners from the point of view of the world sheet. Yeah. Now that derivative, if we ever want to look at it, uh, often the way we actually work 
is make it patchwise flat. But then in, if you want to get the transition functions right, we have to answer your questions. Okay, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the derivative includes the spin connection. Uh, between, you can make it patchwise flat. Okay. Genuinely flat, yes. Uh, so, and that's enough for many purposes. But when, when you want to compute the partition function, for instance, it will be, it will relate to the question of what is the spin structure of the fermions as you go around, around. and so on. So, uh, it's nothing com that you can complete, do to completely get rid of. What? Shift symmetry, um, shift symmetry is gone. That's correct. That's correct. Shift symmetry is gone. So I mean, you know, you may or may not be interested in this for some physical purposes. For instance, when we understand, when we try to study the Welsh, this as a Welshy theory of a string in flat space, we will not put this term there unless there is some physical context that requires us to. As you said, it will break, break Lorentz invariance. But just as a two-dimensional conformal field theory. This is a perfectly well-defined conformal field theory with a perfectly well-defined stress tensor. Now, I want to quickly, I want to quickly understand the properties of this, uh, this, uh, the, uh, of this theory. Okay, so there are two or three OPs I want to compute. The first is T of Z, T of zero. Okay, I'll leave as an exercise for you to check that the nons, that the non one over z to the four pieces obey the standard OPs of a stress tensor. Two t plus uh, derivative t by two t by z squared plus derivative of t by z. But I'm going to compute the z to the four piece so that we can read off the change in the central charge. <laughs> It is going to change the most, oh sorry, of x's, uh, the x, x op is unchanged because that is just, you know, in order to understand the x, x op, you only need the action in flat space and the action in flat space is not changed. Why do I need only the x op? Because the x, x op came from solving the Schwinger Dyson equation of the path integral in flat space. You are in a general curve. No, no, I'm not in a general curve. I was in a general curve metric only to the extent that I needed to derive the stress tensor. Oh, okay. Uh, otherwise, you are not. I'm not. I could be, but at the moment, I'm not. I'm just working in flat space. But if you are on general curve metric, yes. this R is locally still flat. R is locally still flat. What does flat mean? Uh, meaning. Uh, one, 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 zero. Yeah. No, it's not zero. It's not because anyway, in a local. Then I do not even expect that all the OP is sustained because of this coupling. Not in flat space. In flat space, the theory is unchanged. It's only the operator and the stress tensor that has changed. So suppose we are studying the theory on the plane. Yes, but if it was a general metric, and then lo then things change. Will change. Because locally, your act theory is changed. Lo yeah. Local it is not even local in time. Correct. It's a, however, it will change in a soft way. Because this R here uh, has uh, factors of one over, you know, this, the derivatives of x, okay, are replaced by just a number for R. So it's a little like adding a mass term. Not quite because it's not x squared, but it's a little like that. So, to the extent that very short distance properties are determined by very high momentum, yes. that will not change. Uh, derivatives on x, you put it on r. What? No. De de see, suppose we look at the two terms. In the first term, let's say we are at very high energies. Okay. You'll be estimated by p squared x squared. Yes. In the second term, we'll ex estimate it by number, which is whatever the number that r is, times x. When p is very large, the first term will dominate the second term. Okay. 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 
So the extreme short distance properties will not change. But there will be some short distance properties that will change. It's a matter of detail. OK? But at the moment, we're just going to look at this theory in flat space. And then nothing has changed, except we're looking at a different operator. It's just our choice of which operator to look at that has changed. Otherwise, the theory has remained unchanged. And if the central charge changes, does that mean that our choice of dimensions for the power now is If you use this as one of the th uh, components of the theory, yeah. the world sheet theory of the string, that would change that, yes. We are not we planning to do we that. Able to <coughs> from, from, from the light cone quantization with no reference to stress tensors, we, we just, you know, we, we did that with, yes. without even seeing any of this. We, we yes. And we, how did we get that? It's because number go to action gave us the Polyakov action, including the coupling to L sheet metric. And this term was not there. Okay. So, if we take the stress tensor that we got from the physical considerations standing with Nambu go to action, we are landing up with this theory at A equals 0. Okay? So I want to emphasize that we are not, the, th the road we are going to go down with this theory is not, at least at the moment, though people have tried this, uh, to replace one of the factors in the Welshi theory of the string by this factor. That's not the road we are going to go down. I'm just going to doing a little exercise in the abstract conformal field here. Okay? Um, however, you know, if you guys were at Atisha's talk, for instance, and people have tried very hard to make, to use this, to make modified string theories in space time, often in context of interest to them, context of cosmology, context of something else. You know, in context where you don't want space time to be Lorentz invariant, for instance. Okay? And, you know, one should keep an open mind. None of these efforts have been very successful so far, in my opinion. But one should keep an open mind. But that's not the road we're going down at the moment. I'm just making an observation about How abstract conformity. How dispenses field. something as sacrosanct as Lorentz moving square? Well, for instance, cosmology dispenses with that, right? In the sense that it's not that our, th our, uh, our world is uh, Lorentz invariant. It's locally Lorentz invariant. Okay? So, you know, there's an arrow of time. All the galaxies are, you know, there is a distinguished, almost distinguished frame in which, co-moving frame with the galaxies and so on. You know, all the usual things. Right? I mean, fine. L let's not get in there. Hmm. Get into that. Okay. Fine. So, let's, let's do this computation. Go on. How are they related? Well, you know, in the sense. See, you have to. The first question is why do you care about the stress tensor? In string theory, we care about the stress tensor for a very particular reason. We are going to gauge the theory by diffeomorphisms. Okay? Uh, we are going to gauge the theory by these Vera Soro. Symmetry. Okay. So for that, knowing the stress tensor is all important. We need a physical principle to give us what the right stress tensor is. And as we discussed, if our starting if our principle was starting with number go to action, we had that principle and we got it. Okay? Uh, beyond that, it's not so clear how much you care. It, it's for your application. You see, let's say that energy is physical. Energy is not going to be affected by such an improvement. Okay? And you should just look at it case by case. I mean, what do you actually care about the theory? Could you generalize the FR kind of direction? F of R. Um, you know, if R is not linear, then it will not affect the stress tensor in flat space. Because if you differentiate once, you'll still have an R left behind, mm -hmm. which will be a vanishing flat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
All excellent questions, but let's let's move on. <laughs> okay. Now uh, we're going to com compute the most singular piece of this. Okay. Just to make sure we're getting all our normalizations right, I'll recompute it for the part that we've done many times before. Remember that uh, we have minus alpha prime log of uh, alpha prime by two log z, log z x x log mod z squared. But we're only looking at the holomorphic parts. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. So let's let's do this. Um, what, the most singular part comes from contracting both del x's with both del x's. There are two choices. Okay. So this guy goes to two times, and then each of the de, uh, each of the um, uh, each of the del x's gives us uh, uh, each of the del x's gives us derivative times derivative on log z. Okay, and so each of the uh, uh, del x's gives us um, uh, one by yeah, so alpha by two times uh, um, alpha by two squared times there was a factor of two, and then we get one by z to the four, and there are various signs, but they go away because it's squared. Okay. So we got, uh, uh, and uh, we had a minus one by alpha, uh, minus one by alpha prime, which is also squared. Thank you. So that gives us half z to the four, and that helped us. Uh, remember the general rule was c, c by two by, by z to the four. So that was the c equals one. Okay, very good. Now we have two more terms to look at. There's this guy with this guy. Okay, there the, are well, three more terms to look at. So let's do them one by one. Let's take minus one by alpha prime by del x del x with a del square x. Now, what is the maximum singularity, sing singularity you'll get when we do this? One over? One over one cube. Del x with del squared x will give us 1 over z cube. Yeah. But you'll never get 1 over z to the 4. No, no. The, the the x with x is log, so it's totally three derivatives of that. Yeah. Okay, so 1 over z cube. So del squared x with del squared x will give the most uh, Only, so these terms will not affect the 1 over z to the 4, and in fact will cancel. I don't know if you remember, we had a general argument that you can't get yes. such a thing, a 1 over z cubed term. It will cancel. Okay. So the only thing that will remain is the a squared del squared x del squared x. Okay. So now let's see how that goes. Z and 0. Now we'll have to be a little more careful about our signs. We'll get a squared del squared 1, del squared 2, times minus alpha prime by 2, times log of z12. Right? Yes. OK. Now let's count the signs. For, well, firstly, if we do it without signs, we'll get uh, z, then a factor of z squared, z cube, z to the 4. But in going from z squared, uh, z squared, so we get a factor of 6, is this right? The number is 6 a squared into alpha prime. Yeah, 4 minus 1 factorial. And then there's a sign. Yeah. Right, because log gives no, no factor, minus 1 gives a factor minus 1, minus 2 and minus 3. Okay, so that's 6. And now, now there's. And also one two. Yeah, because of one two, there is yeah. only a relative factor. No, that, that won't change those factors. It's just a sign. No, you can yeah, I mean, it's not factor sign. That's what I mean. No, no, sign. But if you have the, let's say the, the two is the one that gives you the minus sign, you'll have two of them. There's an even number of ones and uh, Yeah, uh, well, we, we can make them all del one squares for yeah, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Del, del one to yes, the four? Yes. So log minus plus minus. Yeah. 
No sign. <laughs> okay, so we just get this. Okay, so we have C is equal to, and then we're supposed to, you know, not count the two when we count C. So one minus six alpha prime is one. <coughs> Okay. No, we have explicitly alpha prime dictating the, the allowable dimensions, right? If you if regard this as the uh, component if of the well sheet, then. Alpha prime would sort of be something like the tension of the frame. Right? Yes. Well, you know, it's just that this this term here has dimensions. You know, in the sense that if you give x unit distance in space time, this is an x square, but this is just an x. So this quantity here has dimensions of length in space time. Okay. Yeah. So, so, I mean, something needs to non-dimensionalize it. Yeah. I, this. This yeah. We have introduced another scale. Now that you've said all this, I'm getting worried that I'm not getting the dimensional analysis. The Maybe the, the no a bit over an alpha as well. Ah, wait, I, I forgot the alpha prime here. So I'm sorry. Uh, let's, let's do this more carefully. X squared by alpha prime has the same dimension as x times a. So a has dimension length divided by length square, 1 over length. OK, and now it makes sense, because 1 over length square times uh, non-unitary. C is going negative. That's true. Of course, I, uh, uh, I, I wrote this here, but I could have put an i here. <laughs> in, in, in which case, I would have got a, a, a plus. <laughs> if I started with the real action, I'm not right. I suppose there's no room for an I between here and here. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, so at the moment, we, we, we have probably got this right with some real number. But uh, I want to emphasize, you know, that we are not going to use this as component of well sheet of string. Well, for instance, on the well sheet of the string as auxiliary things, we're very happy dealing with non-unitary theories. BC theory was such a theory. Okay, so this is going to be of that that nature of study. Okay, and typically these theories are non-unitary, even when it is. Because it's less than one, and you are in dangerous one. Yeah, because it's less than one, you are in danger. Yeah, and uh, you actually will never be good because the theories that those discrete values of C are very particular theories, yeah, and this is this is not one of those. Natural. Yeah, so these theories are generically non-unitary. Okay, that's fine and it's true. Okay. No, no, non-unitary. That it will generically that if you were try to make this theory, we imposing the usual hermeticity properties on the stress tensor you will run into generally non-unitarity. OK, fine. But doesn't matter. You know, as, as I said, we've not been scared of dealing with non-unitary theories before. So let's not get scared now at this late stage. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's keep going. Now, the reason I brought this up is uh, something that um, is to answer a question you guys might have had. And that question went this way. Look, I told you that bosonization works when you have two fermions. But though we call them psi and psi bar, as you remember, the actual theories we worked with was identical at the level of the Lagrangian to the BC system. 
you just rename psi as b, c and psi bar as b and at the level of the Lagrangian, okay, th these two theories were beca became identical. Okay, so you might ask what is the correct bosonization? Is there a bosonization of the BC theory? Okay, now in order to address this question, let's do one more, one more little, little exercise here. And that little exercise I wanted to do was the following. Suppose I have e to the power i kx. I want to compute its scaling dimension. Okay. So what we need to do is to take t of z e to the power i kx at 0 um, and look at the maximally singular term. Again, I'll leave, to you, leave you to check as an exercise that you get the form of a primary operator. I'll just try to compute its dimension. The, uh, no, but you see, it's, uh, there are two different dimensions. There's space-time dimension and there's world sheet dimension. Sorry, world sheet dimension is zero because both are two derivatives. So from the point of view of world sheet, so as scale invariant is before. Hmm. Okay, let's compute this t of z e to the pi kx. A, earlier what we got was uh, uh, minus alpha uh, was i k squared by 4 divided by z squared. That came from the al minus alpha prime del x del x e to the pi kx. Now let's get the other guy. So the other guy is uh, a del squared x times sum over m is equal to 0 to infinity i p to the power m by m factorial x to the power m. I've just opened out the exponent. And I take the maximum singularity with each of these. So I get a and then what do I get? minus alpha prime by 2, then one derivative, so, so that's z, and second derivative is z square with a minus 1, so plus, um, and then there will be i p the whole thing squared, and then e to pi p times, the whole by z square. Okay, so please check, but I'm getting minus p squared a by a alpha prime by 2. So <laughs> minus alpha prime p squared, k squared, k squared, ah, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Uh, something's wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I got this wrong. This should have been IP. Because I know one del squared is acting on one, one guy. Okay, so. Uh, but the minus does cancel because it's z square. And so we get uh, minus a alpha prime by minus i a alpha prime k by 2. So minus? I got minus but I might have been, I might have messed up on that. Oh plus, plus sorry, <laughs> plus. I got plus but I might have been messed up. Somebody, somebody has checked? We're going to have to check something soon so uh, the signs will be important to work. Okay, unless somebody protests, I'm going with this. So delta is equal to alpha prime k squared by 4 plus i a alpha prime k by 2. Okay, this is the delta of e to the pi kx. Okay. <coughs> now, 
let us remember okay um, now I want to go to this this discussion of the BC system so let's remember that the BC system was C del B yes Mm -hmm. Why would that change the way operators, like the, just a random operator changes on the change of coordinates? Is the question in the context of why the this anomalous dimension has changed? Why should changing your stress tensor change it at all? Change the anomalous dimension at all? Yeah. Good. Um, Changing the stress tensor changes the anomalous dimension for the following conceptual reason. You see, we have x of z with x of 0 goes to minus alpha prime by 2 log of z. That's x. OK? Um, this is great, except that that log doesn't make sense then. This log doesn't make sense because we've got log of something dimensionful. So something else dimensionful has to come to, to make it completely sensible. So if we were doing something really you know, carefully, we would put some a square. Okay. So conceptually, the way you would think maybe is put a cutoff in your theory. No, the two-point function, if we really take the two-point function, okay. that's just exactly that. Right? Now, one way of thinking of this is to take, a th take the theory and cut it off at short distances. Okay? So one, one thing that you might think is maybe what we should imagine if we're working on a lattice is that this is equal to this for mod z greater than a squared and is equal to 0 for mod z less than a squared. You know, this would be some well-defined thing in some cutoff way. But you know, there's a problem with this. And the problem with this is that z square is z square taken in some metric. Yes, and this thing is not diffeomorphic in that metric. OK? So one way of understanding where why you could ask why does e to the pi k dot x pick up a dimension you know start scaling with some dimension at all why does it pick up some wild transformation property at all given, given that x itself was a scalar shouldn't it be that e to the pi i times i k was just you know didn't have some wild why did it happen how did it happen explicitly and the way it's going is basically this that what you have here is you're putting some things, some short distance cutoff, but what you're doing is cutting off a coordinate distance. That's not good. What you should really do is cut off some invariant distance. Okay? You cut off this invariant distance. So suppose we had, um, uh, suppose we had a, a theory with a while factor. You would put a factor of e to the power phi. If the metric was e to the pi times yeah, eta. Then this would now make it coordinate invariant because this would be the proper distance in that metric. And this e to the power phi, okay, is the heart of why these operators pick up a scaling dimension at all. Pick up, pick up a non-trivial transformation under wild transformations at all. Okay, there's a hidden dependence of the wild factor inside the singularities of the correlator. Now, the way I took this thing and made it diffeomorphically invariant is by knowing how the theory behaved, yes, in non-flat space. Okay, so if I change 
the covariantization of the theory, I change that regulator. Now I would have to think hard about how this way of thinking will actually produce this answer. But that's roughly what's going on. So. <coughs> so then are we sort of using like the stress tensor as like a test function to say, well, if you want this relationship to have this property for the stress tensor, then this is what it has to have for the rest of the thing? Or is it just like, is there something deeper like some sort of relationship between the stress tensor and the metric? Like, Yeah, it's just that you're, if you want, you know, this, this P is really, the Vera Soto algebra is really important in telling you how your theory transforms under wild transformations. And we're just using the stress tensor sort of as like a test function. This, the stress tensor tells us how that works. Right, because what, what, it, what it tells you is how it couples to a general metric and therefore how it couples to the wild factor. So the stress tensor was, you see, what, we do, what we're doing is trying to study the theory just in flat space. But then we want to know how it transforms, were we to change flat space to add a wild factor. So this is like, um, like we have some sort of internal dissonance, right? We can't study it just in flat space and then ask how does it transform if we change the metric. So what part of our study knows is sensitive to how it will change if the metric was not flat space? It was the stress tensor. The stress tensor, by definition, is the derivative of the theory with respect to changing the metric. OK? <coughs> OK, great. Hmm. Fine. So, uh, so, so let's, let's at least quickly complete this algebra today. I, 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 we're going very slow this semester for some reason. Um, but uh, we'll speed up. OK. I keep, keep meaning every class to, com to tell you about the Fermionization of the beta gamma system. We, <laughs> don't, we never get that. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, but okay, let's quickly finish this and then. <coughs> okay. Now, let us remember that the BC system, BC theory was defined by that Lagrangian. Okay, so there's some 1 by 2 pi and so on. Okay. Uh, does, does anyone have a good enough memory to remember the stress tense of the BC system? Tell, tell me, C is equal to? B del C minus del of B C and lambda minus half. Um, no, 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 not del square. It should, should be one derivative. Uh, I'll, I'll look in Polchinski to this. Oh, del B C minus lambda del B C. Okay, what? Lambda. What's the dimension? Uh, yeah, la lambda is the. Yeah, but lambda, uh, the dimension of B is lambda. And the dimension of C was 1 minus lambda. Yeah, yeah sorry. Delta B was equal to lambda, delta C was equal to 1 minus lambda. OK, now I'm going to rewrite this stress tensor as follows. T is equal to del B C minus, and I'll put a half here, del B C plus lambda minus half into del of B C. And then I'll simplify this guy. The point is that this can now be written as del B C by 2 minus B del C by 2. Symmetrically in B and C. <coughs> okay, and we can even, if you want, write this as, uh, to make it even look even more symmetric, this is del B C. Because C, exactly, del B by 2. And this was the stress tensor of the psi psi bar theory. It was del psi psi bar plus psi del psi bar. Okay. So you see that the BC theory has the same Lagrangian, therefore the same operator product expansion, same correlation functions for all fact insertions of B and C as we had for insertions of psi and psi bar. And therefore the BC theory 
You remember in our discussion of bosonization, we started by arguing that all correlation functions on the plane of uh, insertions of psi and psi bar were equal to correlation functions for, of insertions of e to the power h and e to the power minus h. But the same argument tells us that that's the, that's the case for B and C. Because the operator product al algebra of B and C is just exactly that of psi and psi bar. Correlation functions of insertions of B and C are by definition exactly the same as the correlation functions for psi and psi, psi bar. The only way the BC system differs from psi psi bar, uh, it's a vector and we see that in the stress tensor. The only place it differs is in the stress tensor. Okay, so what we see is that this thing here differs in lambda minus half del in this term, del BC. So had this term not been there, this would have been just the usual free boson. The bosonization of this would have been the free boson. Now, what this is is taking the bo free boson field uh, uh, st the theory and adding an improvement term to its stress tensor. Okay, but let us remember what was BC? BC was equal to I del H. Composite operator, right? Composite operator. Exactly, but remember we had in one of the last two classes we found that psi psi bar. Exactly. And therefore, what we should expect is that the BC system can be bosonized to an H such that <coughs> TH is equal to del H, the whole thing squared, <coughs> minus half. Okay. Uh, in fact, not, right? Because C has dimension minus 1. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. B uh, BC is equal to I del H. Uh, so this gives us plus lambda minus half into I del square H. <laughs> Let me see if. Pulchinski has the same. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, now Pulchinski has a minus. I'm really sorry about that. I'll just stick to it. Uh, it must be that if we do it carefully. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. We can go through that more carefully, but let's not leave it. Okay, it was all whether it was psi, psi, bar, psi, bar, psi. Right, we have to think that through more carefully. But, okay. Minus i del squared h. Okay, so now let us check this in various ways. Let us first use this to compute the central charge of this uh, t uh, this t theory. Okay, so the central charge of this t theory, well, we have a lovely formula. Uh, One minus uh, six alpha prime. Uh, a, which oh, a square. Thank you. One minus six alpha. So then, because of the i, it will become plus lambda minus half the whole thing squared, and then we're happy. Are we good? Yeah, I mean, alpha is here just two. What? Alpha is. Yeah, alpha is just two. Yeah, you're right. Two. Okay, and uh, uh, let's check when lambda is equal to two what this becomes. Uh, it should have been minus 26, right? What's going on? What happened? Minus sign, so we've messed up somehow. Let us see in our calculation of central charge. So the I is like this line is just minor because I square means your minor. A square is A is minus by lambda minus half. But yeah, 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 yeah. I think we messed up in this formula. Just a minute. Uh, 
del squared, g give me a minute. Um, del squared x, del squared x, so there's a minus alpha prime by two, and then I am still getting a. I'm still getting a minus. I'm still getting a minus. Let me just see what he does. Just, just. So there, there will be a relative minus. Yeah. So that will be a plus because right. it's happening four times. So first time it becomes one over z, then it becomes minus one over z squared. Then it becomes plus two over z cube. You're right. Minus you're right. You're right. I messed this up. Yeah. Uh, minus uh, six over. This, this, yeah. You're right. This becomes yeah. plus. So this was, thank you. So Indranil's complaints, some of them might have gone away, except now they're back because we're. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, if we now set lambda equals two. This is 1 minus 12 into 3 by 2 things squared. Minus 26. This is equal to minus 26. I accept it on higher authority. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, excellent. So this actually is the uh, uh, central charge of the BC system. Moreover, if, before we completely believe this, let us check the dimensions of, of B and C. So what was this A? This uh, A here was minus I lambda minus half, right? So delta is equal to um, now K squared by two plus I in a m into minus I in a lambda minus half K and the, the two is cancelled. Okay. So it's equal to K squared by two plus lambda minus minus half in a K. Uh, no, no it's I, I, I into minus I. Yeah, okay. Now let's set K equals. You see, B and C are K equals plus and minus one. Okay, so let, let's, and so lambda is uh, uh, two, so this is one half plus three by two. Yeah, k is equal to one. And then we get half minus three by two. k is equal to minus one. This is the dimension of b. And this is the dimension of C. Okay, fine. So you see that the BC system can also be bosonized. Okay, and the bosonization is, and somebody please write this down in your notes and so square it because we'll never get the signs right again. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so the, the BC system is the is the, is this with this choice and then the identification b is equal to e to the pi h c is equal to e to the power minus i h uh, central charge is c is equal to 1 minus 12 into lambda minus half squared delta b is equal to um, half plus uh, lambda minus half, so it's lambda. Hmm. And delta C is equal to one minus lambda. Yeah, one minus lambda. Perfect. So there is a, we have now a bosonized form of the BC system. Okay, this will also sometimes be useful for us uh, when we're actually doing calculations. We might sometimes want to use this bosonized form. 
uh, in our computations. Yes? <coughs> Wait, but let, let's see. Uh, we've not fixed anything. We've just viewed it as a deformation of a, fix, of, of a good theory. So had this improvement term in the stress tensor not been there, this lambda minus half, the BC system would have been a regular fermionic theory. Wait, but that deformation came from deforming its wild transformation. Well, deforming how it responds to, the, to a change in the metric in general. In particular, it's that deformation that changed whether B was a two form or a spinner. Yeah. Whether B C was, a, uh, was right. a vector or a spinner. So it changed a lot, including its wild transformations. But it changed, you know, quite a lot. It changed, it, it's changed its complete transformation properties under local Lorentz transformation. Right, so, wha wha but what you correctly said is this, that what we can do is to take that this improvement term is serious enough. To make yeah, to make, to view it as a deformation of something completely reasonable. Namely, the BC theory would have been totally reasonable had B and C been spinners. So the deformation term takes the theory where they were spinners and turns them into vectors in two forms and two, two, two tensors. That, that is correct. It's not that it's cured anything about the theory. It just allowed you to see it right. as a deformation of something good. OK, I think that's, uh, uh, that's it for today. Uh, in tomorrow's class, we will really, uh, wherever, wherever, in the next class we have, we will really talk about the fermionization of the beta gamma system. And then we will come back and understand uh, the BRST quantization of the superstring and then, then we will really be in a position then to understand the superstring. Then we will start writing down, I'll try to explain to you exactly what the superstring is. You know, what a spectrum is, what the theory is, what a spectrum is, and uh, what the rules for scattering are. Okay, that's maybe two, three more lectures we will un uh, understood those things. And then we will get to the physics part of the course, namely to start doing calculations. The, the, that formalism will be largely dealt with. Okay. <coughs>